the thing is that I thought like, you know, like for the exam that you take everything and even your underwear. And I took my underwear totally as I do in French, you know. Oh my because, God, yeah. <laughs> but no, because, because they have to, to, to watch everywhere, you know. And, and then the assistant came and he was like just blushing like crazy saying, no, 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 you don't have to, to take it off. Salut YouTube. As you guys can see, I have my headphones on and I have someone with me all the way from New York City, but it's a special someone because it's a Frenchie. So hi Margot. Bonjour Rosie. <laughs> this is super cool because on my channel I'm often talking about expat culture shocks in France and, and often talking about things that you know Americans might find shocking in France and stuff. We're gonna do it the other way around and we're just gonna have a discussion about the things that we've noticed um, between the US and France. So Margot tell us a little bit though about your story. How did you end up living in New York City? So I'm a French born uh, citizen uh, indeed uh, but um, I decided seven years ago to put my life upside down for love of jazz um, nice. He start the history from a little bit uh, further. Uh, I had a career as a classical train harp player, but it so happens that two big stars, one in the jazz world, Monica Passos, who is a Brazilian mm -hmm. singer, and the other one, uh, a star from the pop world, uh, Nolwenn Leroy, asked me to be a part of their tour. And even though it, even though it was one of the best times of my life as a, as a professional, mm. I ended up thinking that Maybe I could take the risk to be in a, a leading position more, you know. I decided mm -hmm. to go uh, in Berklee College of Music. But let's say that between wow. the moment that I auditioned in Paris yeah. and the moment, moment I left to, uh, to uh, New York, uh, to uh, Boston first, uh, it was only three months. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I had literally no preparation. I was really not prepared, you know, like to leave this experience. I didn't, I just know, you know, America from the movies, you know, and so yeah, like, for, for, for sure, when I arrived, I had a series of cultural shocks, <laughs> for sure. Um, but I would say that now, like years after, it's really a choice for me to be, to be here. And I can express that in a way that I put some, I, I create some extra space in my heart for this new culture and yeah. now that I see, you know, that like behavior or things that was very opposite to me when yeah. I arrived, it was a shock. Now I don't see opposition at all. I, I see two sides and two perspectives of, of the same reality. I have a, a deeper understanding, I would say. Mm, I, I didn't realize our story had so many similarities actually because I found oh. out that I got into my master's program three months before moving to Paris. I had no idea what the streets looked like. I knew that there was the Eiffel Tower and the Arc de Triomphe and that is it. Like I had no idea. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing today? What, what kind of projects do you have on in life? I arrived in America for jazz but I discovered that my French roots uh, had a very warm welcome uh, for the yeah. American population. I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. And I ended up um, you know, like producing a, a show that is called the Piaf Experience. Mm -hmm. um, and cool. in, inside is, is developing the roots of the Parisian, the French Parisian cabaret, mm -hmm. but crossed with the American jazz perspective. Amazing. And yeah. like, where can people find out more if they want to come and see you? Uh, so definitely there is a lot on the on the website, so uh, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there would be the, the link uh, uh, below. Um, yeah, definitely, I will. Yeah. So th there is a residency in, uh, in Bonafide Jazz Club in New York, but I would mm -hmm. say what is very new and the latest news is that we will have our first premiere uh, in Birdland, which is a very exposed jazz club and we are super excited about that and it will be in November wow. 22nd and 23rd. Oh, cool. Perfect. Cool. So tell me, New York girl, um, <laughs> yeah. still, um, tell me about some of the culture shocks. So I would say the, the first cultural shock that you can notice is definitely on, on the basic needs. So I would okay. say be understood, food and health. I would say that this is where it was absolutely like obvious that mm. I, was, I was not coping with reality the same way that the people around me. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say on the communication at the very first, at the very first beginning in Boston, what I did notice is that people had a very hard time to hear me, and I was like, as a French citizen, I was just reacting, saying, "How does it come that there is so many people they have ear problems around me? Like, how does it come? You know?" <laughs> and then they're all deaf. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's going on here? You know? And there, 
but they, they, they were making me repeating all the time. And even at some point, they just like gave up, you know, because they couldn't hear me properly. And, <laughs> and meanwhile, meanwhile, I was thinking like, why are people are shouting when they are talking or in the subway? Mm. I mean, it, it was very strange to me. And with a little bit of time, I discovered that we are not using the, the voice the same way, that articulation and projection is not the same. Even when, when you see education for, for, for children, you know, like they are very, mm. I would say, encouraged to project their voice, to be heard, to, there is no limit and nobody is, is saying, oh, be quiet or be more silent. Like it's, it doesn't appear yeah. very clearly in the education of children that they have boundaries not to be heard. You know what I mean? I totally know what you mean. Yeah. I noticed that in France, in the, in, the, in the French parenting style, it was always like, be sage, be calm, be quiet. Yeah. It's all very much like, shush, shush, shush. And I really appreciate developing that in me, that I, I gain some confidence in my speaking and I yeah. dare to be heard. Also, I would say uh, the, the, the shock was about enthusiasm. It's a kind of filter that I'm going to communicate on things that are positive, that are going to uplift people, or they're mm. going to encourage people, or they're going mm. to, to support people to connect more with me, or to be more involved in the project, or whatsoever. Where in France, I think that when I'm back in France, or when I'm communicating with French people, I am more on my side of being more, I wouldn't say sincere, because American is sincere as well, but I would say I will get to the core of the emotions, and mm. if somebody is asking me, how are you doing? I will feel the space in France or with French people to say, ah, you know, my day was not that good or I'm a little bit down today and it will be perfectly okay, you know, and really say exactly what's on my mind. I, I've got no filter. I don't have to, yeah. to have this precaution of, of not hurting people or not, if, you know, like just like making people uncomfortable with, with my thought and if it's not too direct, something like this. I would totally. Say. When I'm back in France now, my friends, tend to make fun of me because first of all they call me the l'américaine <laughs> why because i'm just like over over uh, for, for them over exaggerating or over reacting to things like for instance they say oh i did just bought a a, a plant or something and i'm just like oh that's so great and something and, <laughs> and they are correcting me saying no it's just a plant you know so it's it's okay yeah. it's fine yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd really love to hear the French perspective on you're saying food and health so tell me more <laughs> yeah so I would say for the funny side uh, le, my first impression in America is that I was buying food but food didn't taste like food <laughs> okay. meaning that vegetables had no taste in my in my perspective as I was just looking for oh it's, it's strange like those tomato doesn't have any taste so it's you know like it's very subtle Mm. And then uh, I was thinking, oh, I have to buy organic tomatoes. Maybe it will change. And it was almost the same. I was very judgmental. Mm. Till I understand that the production of the, of the food is totally different. And also, I would say, the levels of antibiotics or pesticides, whatsoever, are not the same. So mm. what this means is that the soil is not the same. So obviously, you don't have the same taste. So I found a solution for that. I'm a part of a food cooperative now. Um, oh, cool. that has very affordable organic food and definitely now I am totally uh, comfortable with the food I eat. And what about the time, amount of time you spend eating? Oh yeah, so what I notice is that my, my need to have three uh, meals a day and to sit at each meal and to have, I don't know, like two, two dishes or two or three dishes Mm -hmm. It tends to disappear. The cliche as American people, they don't care about food. That's absolutely not true at all. They are very foodie, like mm -hmm. super foodie. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is that I would say that like, they, they give a chance to have the choice to be flexible. Flexible mm -hmm. about appetite. If you don't feel that you, you want to eat something, like you respect more your body because you don't have to sit and eat a full meal. I'm in uh, intermittent fasting for a few months that I feel like the better shape and the better, you know, like energy that I've never experienced before. Mm -hmm. And maybe in France, I would have been very judged about like oh, yeah. this lifestyle. You know what I mean? Oh my gosh, of course. Like if you're not sitting down for those three full meals at those very specific times, then you're wrong. Yeah, yeah. So on the opposite, <laughs> When I went back once in France and I was jet lag and I didn't know what time it was and just my stomach was 
really craving for food. Mm -hmm. I grabbed a sandwich in a boulangerie and I didn't notice it was 8 in the morning. So I, <laughs> I had my sandwich and I was so, so hungry that I just took a bite, you know. And yeah. then I, I, I came in the bus and the, the driver had really a scream like, <gasps> like what's going on? Like because I <laughs> just saw a girl with a sandwich like really it's not very possible. hungry. <laughs> and I don't look in the morning and re seriously like his reaction, he didn't say a lot of things. Never, yeah, never was everything. Seen that and so now I know that in France I I tend to not to eat in the street and uh, you know, I mm. respect that because I, I think it's a uh, not hurting people, but it can be a little bit shocking for... for yeah, that's true. You, ca you can't really eat in the street or on the go. It's not really okay. And you had a story maybe about the healthcare or health yeah. uh, side of things? Yeah, so definitely at the beginning when I was in, uh, in America and I was, uh, you know, like uh, feeling that the people were super paranoid about germs, about people sneezing yeah. in the subway and stuff. I don't know, like it was, suddenly somebody was sneezing, it was a drama. It was everybody yeah. like, was looking to each other like, saying like, yeah. we're going to wear all the yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> And also my, my parents are uh, doctors and they, t they tend to, to have educated me to say, don't over sanitize, don't over uh, wash your hands mm. all the time. It mm. was my belief my whole life. And then I arrived in America where you can see people like putting some tissues on the, on the bars, you know, like uh, to to prevent not to hold directly the bar and so on. And I was yeah. like, like, people, are you crazy? It was my first reaction, <laughs> you know, are you crazy people? And then after that, I had uh, some moments where I was ill and I had to go to the hospital and I had to pay the hospital and I had to pay the doctors and I was like, ah, oh, no, I got it. So yeah, that's why here. they don't want to get sick. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So definitely I switched now to uh, more a prevention mode. The numbers I see on, on, the, on the papers, on the records, are enormous. Mm. It's, it's, we are talking about thousands of dollars. Yeah. You know? and, and it's a game between the insurance and the hospital to, yeah. I don't know how they, they manage that, but it's, it's really, it's insane. And also the thing is that sometimes you get some exams done, you never ask them, but the doctor thought that it was good, but they didn't took the information to the assistant or whatsoever, and then suddenly you have a bill that comes from nowhere. So it's a little bit unpredictable, I would say, and there, yeah. is, a, okay. there is fear in all different stages of the process. And also because people want to prevent to any lawsuit, Low no yeah. <laughs> sorry. No, sorry for my accent. Uh, <laughs> the, the thing is that, uh, yeah, it, it makes a pressure and it, it makes the attention not on the on the people but more in the process of insurance and payments and so on. I, I went to a dermatologist because I've got some uh, some mold everywhere on my I always had some mold on my body and it's perfectly normal but I have to check regularly mm. and the thing is that I thought like you know like for the exam that you take everything and even your underwear and I took my underwear Totally, as I do in French, you know. Oh my because, God! Yeah. <laughs> you know, because because they have to, to to watch everywhere, you know, and and then the assistant came and he was like just blushing like crazy, saying, "No, no, no, no! You don't have to to take it out." But, but why are you making it so complicated? Like just like watch what what is on my body and that's all, you know. He's like, "I'm not going to pursue you in low, low suit or whatsoever." It's, it's yeah, so yeah, exactly. I think that the the assistant of the dermatologist thought that I was I don't know like really like crossing some boundaries. The French nympho coming in for her. Yeah, yeah, so I okay. was so, no, like, do you job properly? Because I've got someone everywhere. So like, uh, do you job properly? And the last point I think you said was around like the attitude and the busyness and that kind of thing. Do you want to elaborate more on that? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. So, it, and, it's, and it's hard to explain to, to my French friends who studied in, uh, in, in France. Uh, there is a, a little, I would say, a subject that is a little bit hurting uh, people because they, they, they tend to, to find it like a judgment that in France we don't like to work or we are lazy or we are not business mm. oriented whatsoever. When I decided to come to America to study, I was 36 years old. But I find like so, I don't know, such freedom in that, that there is no limit. That if I'm failing one day, as long as I get up and you know I'm, I'm moving forward, nobody mm. is going to to point me with a finger saying, "Hey, you failed." But there is always, I would say, uh, encouragement and like, people here. They are just behind. Yeah, go for the it. Yeah, following exactly. the dream. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. 
I follow you, Dean, but also like it's not a problem at all to fail. In an Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. context, if someone obviously is aside from like doctors and engineers and stuff, but if someone wants to change from human resources to marketing to communications, they absolutely can. Mm -hmm. If they want to start a business in, in something, they absolutely can. It's you know, it's like you have the skills as a person, you've got resilience, you've got adaptability, you're bright, you can learn. It's very much yeah. like you can do it, of course. I saw it in my French HR colleagues, they're like, uh, not the right school. And I'm like, are you serious? She's obviously a very bright, ad adaptable person. Like, you know, she, of course she can do this job. They're like, hmm, she hasn't done it before though. Of course she hasn't done it, done it before. She wants to do it now for the first time. <laughs> you know, so I found it really, I found it really hard in that, in that respect. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I'm like for, for to, to be absolutely clear about that, um, I'm here in America this time in my life because this is the, the best moment and this is what I need for the moment. I need some, some freedom in my business. In, in three or four years, my, my priority would be different and yeah. I would say the joie de vivre or to prioritize my family time mm. uh, will be more important. But totally. for this moment, this is, this is why I, I really don't want people to, to understand me wrongly. Uh, I left my country not because I don't like France or I don't like my culture. Mm. I left my country because I had an opportunity and an open door. And mm. I took it because at this specific moment of my life, this is what, what makes me happy. And the thing, that, what I was saying at the beginning of the, of the video is like, um, one culture is not replacing the other one. I don't know no. how you feel yeah. you know, about your experience, but it, it's, it seems to me like like you have a child, you make some more space in your heart for it. So I feel totally French. I don't deny a, a inch Absolutely. of my culture, of, of, my, of my experience. Yeah. Yeah. But I developed another part of Margot, I would say, mm. uh, who is definitely American. Like, and, I, and I embrace it with, with respect and, and, and gratitude like you can't imagine because I couldn't expect that from me in my, in my heart and in my life, you know, so it's just a chapter of, of, of my book that it's adding to the other ones. And yeah, so from the moment it was a cultural shock where it was a lot of opposition between my belief and what I was experiencing. Now there is, there is um, I would say, very quiet and peaceful uh, um, uh, coexisting, uh, coexistence. Yeah. Yeah. Coexistence, yeah in my heart. Yeah, you summed it up beautifully. I feel exactly the same way where the two exist and you didn't realize that you could have space for two, but you can. So that oh, sums it up really, me. really beautifully. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing your experience. And as you were just saying, you guys, like if you've, if you can relate to these points or if you've had shocks, if you're French and you've lived in the States, let us know down below what were your big culture shocks and did you have any, I guess, like awakening moments, really reaching that level of cultural understanding. Guys, don't forget to check out the description box if you are interested in Margot's work and her shows. We're going to have the links down below, the dates down below. How cool would it be if you can go and see her and say hey from the Not Even French channel. Um, Definitely. <laughs> yeah. It would be so much fun. Yeah, yeah I, would I would love to. We'll yeah. see you guys next time on the Not Even French channel. A bientôt. A bientôt.